and I would say with entrepreneurs, be crystal clear on your origin story, the emotion behind it, how you want the world to change, and therefore, what's your what is your brand promise? Mm -hmm. What's your value prop and brand promise? And more importantly, what are the proof points? How are you going to show it differently? If you focus on that, everyone else is going to go under, and you're literally going to iterate on. There literally it comes down to three words, right? Usually, most brand promises are like three words. And they go usually go back to some origin story, like I remember when Aunt Susie blank, right? And they never forget it. The first disclaimer: this is not your typical venture podcast. We assume the listener or the viewer can Google simple things like stage, industry focus, average check size, etc. Guests and interviewers do consume alcoholic drinks during the taping of our show. So we do so responsibly and we ask that everyone do so as well. So let's begin. Hello and welcome to season three of Drinks with a VC. Thanks for tuning in via whatever platform you are using. I am Vic Laquara. I am the co-founder and managing director of Green Cow Venture Capital. And I'm joined, as always, by my brilliant co-hostess with the mostest, Brie Hansen, who leads BizDev for Berkland, a wonderful firm that provides CFO services for technology startups. Hey, Brie, where have we been? It's been a while. I don't know. Uh, I still have some COVID brain fog. Oh, right. COVID. Yes, we both had COVID. That was really brutal, as if the pandemic didn't provide enough problems for humanity, some of us went off and are making matters even worse. And it's been absolutely heartbreaking to turn on the news and see all the devastation and loss of life in the Ukraine. Um, I was reading Eric Newcomer's newsletter, Newcomer. It's fantastic, by the way. I don't know the guy. He's a former Bloomberg and information writer. Anyway, he offers a way for all of us to directly help Ukrainian families uh, through the 1K project. We'll drop that link into the episode description below. So if you feel compelled to donate to help families that have been afflicted by the ongoing conflict, you can do so there. Anyhow, why don't we jump back into uh, the episode and we've got an illustrious guest on. I actually met our guest once at a crosscut Christmas party, and although it should be very memorable because who, of who he is, it was a little fuzzy given uh, that it was a crosscut party. Well, allow me to refresh your memory a little bit then, Brie. Our next guest has been named one of the top 100 VCs in the US, a Media 100 and Hollywood 100 power player. He's also the founder and trustee of the McCall Family Foundation that advocates for social entrepreneurship and women's rights. He is a partner at Pritzker Group Venture Capital and was formerly a partner with DFJ Portage. He's been involved with investments from healthcare all the way to media such as Analyt Health, Awesomeness TV, FeedBurner, Imago Scientific, Left Hand Networks, Playdom, and Tickets Now. He's got his own blog, somethingventured.com. Please welcome, hailing from La Jolla, California, and zooming in from Grand Rapids, Michigan, Matt McCall. Great welcome to, to the show, Thank Matt. You. So happy to be here. It, you know, we are very happy to have you. Uh, when I heard you were coming on, we were doing all this research. Bree and I were talking. Uh, we, you and I, Matt, have so much in common that it's absolutely scary. And it 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 sends tingles up my 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 spine a little bit. <laughs> we're we're both California born. Uh, we're both deathly afraid of sharks, uh, and we both really share a, a love of technology. Um, mine started with the Apple Two C. I'd love to hear uh, about your first experience with technology and how it came about. Who introduced you to uh, that technology. Yeah, it was just right time, right place. So when I was in um, middle school, uh, seventh grade, I remember programming even before the Apple, the first TRS-80. So Radio Shack had this and you literally saved the programs on a cassette tape. 
Um, and then in ninth grade, I went to prep school. My, the person who really was one of the most influential people in my life, Doc Smith at Kate up in Santa Barbara, um, had terminals from the high school to UC Santa Barbara for the deck PDP 11s. And had also like decked out the entire school in apples. So I actually taught Pascal and Fortran in the summer. Uh, I even as a freshman at Williams during the summer taught, I kid you not, a computer camp in the Sierras where they program in the morning and like canoe and hike in the afternoon. And so awesome. I've always had this like love of technology. And then kind of Williams, I thought, you know, I'm kind of heading towards the buyout world, the merchant banking. And then of course, like the mafia pulled me back in. Tell us more about growing up in Southern California. It was interesting because, um, so so my backstory is kind of, I don't know if I'd say kind of like a Shakespearean introduction to life, which was, um, as you and I were talking about earlier, half my CEOs are women. And I think that goes back to the fact I grew up with just a mom. And not just a mom, but a Mensa, smart, off the Richter Kale, smart, mom who worked at Vogue and she was just a renaissance woman taught me to manage stock portfolios at 11 age 12 we were talking about Joseph Campbell and watching the Bill Moyers interviews about the hero's journey um she was just born 30 years too early right and her brother who will always say she was always smarter than me uh valedictorian at Princeton ran Dylan Reed you know followed behind George Schultz there etc cetera, etc cetera. And I just always said, this is not the world that I would love to see my daughters grow up in, right? Um, because what had happened was my mom got pregnant, my dad got cancer in New York, which is where I was originally born. And by the time I was eight months old, he'd passed away. So she just literally said, I'm gonna pick the farthest point in the map and off to La Jolla we went. So she's from Chicago, I'm 16th generation New York. And I, I always remember their dirt roads. I know that was not the case in La Jolla, but there were no horses, but in my mind, there were horses and dirt roads in La Jolla um, back then. Did you spend a lot of time at the beach in La Jolla, like doing any diving and, and going to the blowhole? I surfed as a kid. So surfing and tennis were my two big sports and I was a horrible surfer, still am. Um, I, uh, Brian Garrett, uh, and I were talking about, so he actually got me to go to Tamarindo to do the uh, Witches Rock Surf Camp. But um, yeah, just, I don't think I'm training pro anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, that, is that why you are, so I, I, out of college, I was in Laguna Beach. Uh, my friends would surf, I would go out with them. And uh, I am also a horrible surfer whereas they were all sponsored and had their click. Um, I think I was mostly going out there just to chill out with them. Uh, but I was always, from a very early age, I was afraid of sharks. Even Damn the sharks. deep end of a pool scared me. Uh, not enough to make me not get in the water, but it scared me. Uh, is there something to your fear of sharks is it something that happened or has it just always been sort of in the back of your mind uh watch out steven spielberg is an asshole um <laughs> actually he's concerned. really nice <laughs> he, is absolutely, he is the master storyteller if i could mentor under him i would there is no better storyteller and that's venture right yeah. i always say when i do uh so i teach classes at or i have taught classes at UCLA, USC, Booth, Kellogg, et cetera. And one of the things I always talk about is making a movie and doing a startup are the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got a director, you've got a CEO, you've got a C-suite, you've got actors, you've got a script, you've got a business plan, you have a storyline, you have to execute, it all has to hold together and people have to believe it. So when you think about uh, venture, um, you have, in all honesty, Steven Spielberg should be one of the deities. But that guy also did that movie Jaws, which as soon as you see that movie, I did not go in, I'm in La Jolla on the beach, did not go in the water for a year. Wow. That movie. Yeah. An entire year. Yeah. No. Yeah. 
Wow. And in fact, the classes that I teach in entrepreneurship are, I mean, almost every class in entrepreneurship is based on like lean startup and here's the business canvas and blah, 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 blah. And by the time the students have gotten through it, they've, it's lost the soul. And so I've been talking to a friend of mine who's probably one of the top teachers of entrepreneurship in the country, I would argue. Um, and we've been talking about like, how would we recraft teaching entrepreneurship? And one of the things we're talking about is let's recraft it as storytelling, Robert McGee, mm -hmm. you know, all of those types of things. And then at that point say, um, you know, like a director, I want to feel this. I want to feel the character. I want to see him in the courtyard. I want to see them crying, gnashing their teeth, right? Oh, and then by the way, uh, what's the cat called TV? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, so that's interesting that you bring this up. I, I have long been a believer that the best founders are also the best storytellers and they create this narrative around the value that they uh, have created for their end user, right? And it's so compelling to get everyone to, to buy in, right? Um, you seem like you were fanatical about storytelling uh, and yet you, you, you became a venture capitalist. Uh, you're also fifth generation sort of investor. Uh, how, why venture? Why why investing then? If you have this kind of like passion and 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 feel for for storytelling, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's kind of a, a calling. I, um, you know, growing up in La Jolla, I, uh, yeah, we moved from New York to La Jolla where we had no legacy, and so I had were the scrapbooks, and like the family farm was Chelsea. Um, in the mid you know, 1800s, we just developed it and over time sold it to, you know, developed it out. My great grandfather was JP Morgan's partner and ran New York Life. And, oh. and so I always, you know, you know, my uncle ran Dylan Reed and blah, 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 all this stuff. And I always thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow in the suits. I'll be a master of the universe. So I go to Wall Street and uh, did merchant banking and got. Not only I got my MBA, but then I got a master's in manufacturing because what do buyout guys do? They we buy, you know, they buy manufacturing companies. So time at Inland Steel and things like that. And you know, the difference between buyouts and venture are buyouts are sculpture. You take something and you chisel away. And venture is a blank canvas and you paint. And there is something amazing about that process. Um, that creative just and the, the storytelling is just part of it and so that's kind of what called to my soul in the universe I always say the universe is the ultimate router you can think about what you want to do and you can plan but was that saying you know when man plans God laughs um, <laughs> and inevitably you know kind of the universe leans in and says oh I see what needs to happen here and and you know this phrase i don't let my kids use the term coincidence ever um so they know painfully they have to use either serendipity or synchronicity uh you you didn't always want to be a vc in fact we were when you were much younger uh harkening back to a kid uh, in la jolla you had early political aspirations that were derailed by scandal uh, do you want to give our listeners a little understanding of of what happened there at at Pollywog. So this, this, this was a very traumatic year. This is also a year that I went from, so second grade was not a good year for me. All the awards were given and the only award left was the physical education award. So everyone else had gotten English and history, whatever. I got the physical education award. So shall we say I was not on the track of Williams. <laughs> um, third grade, Mrs. Adolph. I kid you not, her name was Mrs. Adolph. Wow. Whoa. Early on, I had a very key role in The Sound of Music. And I had one line. All I had to say was, come children, Maria wants to tell us a story. And then everyone would start singing. And I basically said that line into my shoes. No one heard it. The entire play came to a screeching halt. And I was lampooned for that moment for months. 
So just as I was starting to recover from that trauma in third grade, we went on a field trip. I was class president. I very early on was, it was clear I was a leader. And but, but how did you recover from the shoe incident to then rise to be president? Maybe I leaned into my vulnerability. Everyone on this call, please <laughs> lean into your vulnerability. Like it's okay. very, there's a lot of power. You wow. give permission to others to be vulnerable when you're vulnerable. Um, maybe that, you know, third graders luckily have short memories, I guess is all I could say. Um, or it was a rotating presidency. I can't remember what it was, but uh, unfortunately, Nixon was getting impeached and, or had been impeached. So we're studying that in class. I had been told, we'd all been told, don't take anything back from the field trip. And I really like the polywogs. So I put them in a little milk carton, little tiny milk carton, you know, the ones where you, they, like you don't quite know how to open the top. So you just kind of oh, yes. the whole thing open. Yes, yeah. Um, filled it with water, put a couple polywogs in it. And, uh, you know, I, I, won't, I won't say who, but the name rhymes with Dan DePlessis. Um, snitches get stitches i yeah. told him yeah. what i'd done his mom was the other third grade teacher oh he told mom who told mrs adolph i kid you not she wanted to teach what an impeachment proceeding is like oh. went through a trial can you imagine wow that's traumatic wow trial. and then everyone put their heads down and said who votes to impeach him and of course, I poked my head up to see like which of the weasels, you know, I'm gonna have to take retribution on. Yeah. Stephanie A2 Shanus, Brute. A2 Brute. <laughs> and Stephanie Shanus. If anyone knows Stephanie Shanus, give her a shout out, give her a pat in the back, you know, buy her products, do whatever. Stephanie Shanus, I'll say that over and over again, was the only person, 12 angry men, only person to vote for me not to be impeached. And uh, yes, yeah, so I got impeached. And wow. I didn't tell my mom. And for two months, uh, everything was good. And she was at a dinner party and she heard. <laughs> it did not go well. It did not go well. Mm. Across the wow. board. Well, so, nobody can say that your, that your career didn't go well. So Dan and Mrs. Adolf, um, you know, look at him now. I made right? Dean's List every term since then. Okay. <laughs> I don't know something about this is not good because we'll talk a little bit later about my life philosophies this is not good that that that, yeah. that was the, the turning moment but or maybe it was yeah yeah impeachment uh, dramatic I, so dramatic I mean I can't I, I, I can actually picture it like a rolled doll book in the back of my mind is that's that's kind of what it's like uh just oh man okay all right. Polywog like, impeachment. Polywog impeachment. It, it was just horrible. And as a parent, you got to be like, can you imagine what you would do if like, that's what happened to your child? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. The other thing we have in common <laughs> is that we are both squash players. And okay, that's that's unique-ish. But the fact that we're both squash players from California is very... Uh, very unique, I think. Uh, it, just tell me, how did you, who got you into the game of squash? Uh, and then, and for our listeners, by the way, squash is an indoor racket sport, um, rose to popularity, uh, mostly from England. Uh, and then it was very popular in the East Coast, less popular so on the West Coast. Um, and so just tell me how you got into the game. I'm very interested personally. Uh, and then also I'm interested in your story about how you chose Williams as a kid, you know, from La Jolla, why you chose to go all the way to Williams for school. So first of all, the shout out uh, to two things. Brie with that incredible drinking device that she's got. Paron. Paron. You should actually put like, here's where to buy it. This is what oh, yeah, we'll put that in, we'll put the link. Put that in the notes. Um, and then also everyone needs to know that Vic was captain of his squash team. Shout out, right? I was, I was. Let's go, Brewers. Let's Vassar go. College. Yeah, there you go. So I'm gonna weave this into a, a larger narrative. So what I learned was in tennis, I had a 
bad coach, bad fundamentals, lots of talent, a lot of ability, was put in the right place at the right time. Just uh, two things came out of that. One, without the right discipline, without the mastery, right, the right playbook and fundamentals, um, combined with doing it for the wrong reasons. If I was doing it to, to look like the big man on campus or to be enough, that became an issue. And I'm an even killed guy and I was breaking rackets on the side of the net post. Hmm. And so at the same time that, you know, you and I were talking about this earlier, the universe is the ultimate router. Like the, there, my, my uh, car, I have a Tesla and you have to give it a name. So it's a Morfati is my car. Uh -huh. My license plate is karma. Um, <laughs> and Amor Fati is this concept of loving what is, mm -hmm. right? Embracing because everything is there to teach you, right? And also, by the way, it's already happened. So you're pulling your hair out because of what just happened isn't going to change it. So, right? And that could even be a loss of something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was that Nishi um, that was an Amor Fati? Yes. Holy cow. Big points, Brie. You Breeze. could be in the. <laughs> 0.0001% of the folks that have, would nail Omar Fati. And then of course, everything eventually goes back to Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics and then back to Aristotle. Um, but yeah, no, he's the one who made it Omar Fati famous. Um, so everyone note that. Uh, Nietzsche. Yeah, check the box. Nietzsche. Check the box. Um, Breeze on top of it. Breeze I on like top philosophy. Of it. Yeah. yeah. It is. Um, well, anyway, so I will not diatribe yet there. Um, but uh, the but at the same time, the universe it was ironic. I'm playing, so I decided I'm gonna play squash because, by the way, tallest kid in the school, small school at Kate in Santa Barbara, and I suck at basketball. And the coach literally said, "Find another sport." <laughs> I played lacrosse for three days. It cracked my ribs, and I'm like, "Okay, this is not my sport." So I went and played squash. And while I'm hitting freshman year, this old man shows up. He's like 75, this little Yoda character. It's like right out of Star Wars. It's like the hero's journey, like Luke Skywalker, all that stuff, right? Um, mm, but it is yes. Mm. <laughs> 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 it is do or, there is do or not do, there's no try. Um, so <laughs> he shows up and says, you want to hit? And I said, sure, old guy, no problem. And he beats the crap out of me. Yep. It turns out that he had been head pro of the New York Athletic Club for 30 years and had trained all the Ivy players. And he had all the fundamentals. And so for 90 years, nothing happened to Kate. We had the only squash courts, high school squash courts on the West Coast. And uh, nothing happened for 90 years. He was there for four years. And in that period, I was captain of Williams, captain of Harvard. Well, not me, there was another player, Captain Harvard, Captain Prince, Captain Trent, like, and then he stopped and then really kind of nothing after that. And I, the takeaway from my mind, well, first of all, it changed my life. Absolutely changed my life um, and was not in the playbook. And so this is why I would say the universe is the ultimate router, whether it's venture capital or entrepreneurship or whatever. You just have to kind of hold that space open and let the, within reason. I mean, I'm not saying like, you know, Jesus take the wheel. Um, but he taught me the fundamentals. So by the time I was a senior, I was getting recruited on the East coast for squash. And with a McCall gene pool, you got to go for the low popularity sports. If it wasn't squash, it was going to be luge or skeleton. Um, maybe the broom on the curling. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, it literally changed my life that anything about doc Smith at Kate, um, and the computers. Like the, this is life, right? Yeah, because I know there was some family connection to Yale. So I would have been, so when we moved from New York to La Jolla, all I had were the photo albums. Mm -hmm. And I had pictures of my grandfathers and my uncles and my dad all at Yale. And that's where I was gonna go um, as a kid. And I'm like, uh, you know, right? And the old, you know, as I said earlier, when man plans, God laughs. Um, so I get an interview with the squash coach and I can't even remember his name, but all I remember is he was just this area long, long Island lockjaw asshole. Can I say asshole? I, I yeah, guess I just, absolutely. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And he said, well, a little California boy by senior year, 
if you try really hard, you might make the JV. And we have Victor Wagner, the number one player in the country. And I thought to myself, okay, Yale's off the list. And then I'm like, crap, where am I going to go to school? And uh, this is how smart I was in terms of decision making. And also how good the universe is in routing. I bumped into a friend of the family. I was on a cruise with my mom. And I kid you on the Black Sea in the middle of nowhere. And the guy's doing card tricks. And he starts, he's just like the coolest guy ever. He starts talking about Williams and how amazing Williams is and this and that. And so I look it up and they're like, they got computer science and they got good squash. So I'm like, early decision, sight unseen, no interview. There you go. There you go. From a guy and doing card tricks on a cruise in the Black Sea. I, and the Black Sea, who my mom hadn't seen in 40 years since they were at New Trier High School in Chicago together. And uh, turns out, again, the universe wanting to have fun. Uh, that year, we had four All-Americans on the team. The top four players, I played number seven, the not, top four players went 125 and five. We destroyed everyone we played, just yeah. like nine, nine nothing, and played Harvard for the national title. And we decimated Yale 7-2, like just destroyed Yale. And um, you can't make this crap up. Right. And you also can't like I'm going to plan what's going to happen in my life. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, just like throw caution to the wind because I've got a whole approach to VC that <laughs> is not that. But <laughs> there is this element, right, that we over plan, over think, over stress, over whatever our lives. And then the universe comes along. And this is why uh, Carl Jung coined the phrase synchronicity mm -hmm. way back when. He used to say of the 4,000 patients, the right thing seems to happen at the right time to the right patient. Do you know your Myers-Briggs? I do. Oh, my God. Uh, by the way, I know this is inappropriate. This is not this is like a Me Too moment, but Bree, I think I'm going to marry you. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> big, She's I, not like, saying no, so I, I don't know. You know. I, I literally, I, I, I can't, like, anyways. Like, what Matt didn't know is that, that this whole interview was like yeah, me just, secretly planning. No, just it's kidding. just a way. It's just a way for, for Bree and Matt to be an item. Yeah. yeah. So, but in all, in all honesty, the... Um, Bree, what you're, what you're talking about in terms of, you know, well, we'll talk a little bit later about this, but my passion right now is, it's interesting. So, yeah, so I'm a ENFP. So that's why I did, oh, I only, so is Vic. I only, so am I. So I only survived, <laughs> you know, a couple of years at BCG and I'm like, okay, I'm, you they're too. not allowed to do. God, you guys are twins. It's creepy. What are you, yeah, I, Bree, I, what are you? I'm an ENTP. So I am your thinking Close. other half. But we well, all have extroverted intuition as our first. Well, but that's why we get along with you so well. Yeah. And that's why we should absolutely start a morning show. I think <laughs> listeners that's don't get the benefit of the hour before we started recording. <laughs> and so they don't understand that we're already a little bit tipsy, but we've already decided we're going to start a morning show together. Um, we've already decided that Matt's uh, daughter is one of the coolest people on the planet. Um, and we'll get into Pretty that in a, little, in a little bit, but um, I, I don't know. It's, it's so fun because this, I mean, Bree, this is why I signed up to, to host this whole thing with you mm -hmm. is, is so that we could meet people like Matt. Exactly. It's very cool. But it's the very cool. interesting thing is it's so easy to meet people and you don't, here's a, so I've done probably, and we'll talk a little bit later about this. So I've probably done 300 coaching sessions with yeah. people. And in the middle of it, you're like, that's what's going on in the background. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Like, so, so a couple things like what is going on in people's lives and you just don't know what the backgrounds of what they've done judging a book by the cover all this kind of stuff and you know the trick to life is can you actually have dialogues and interactions with people first of all can you live your life intentionally like you get up in the morning mm -hmm. and you look back i call it the saint peter's test which is I think Peter, I know, i'm not catholic but anyways like you talk to the big guy and you're you get hit by the truck you go upstairs and you have to explain the last month and he says okay so i give you these amazing people i give you all these skills you won the ovarian lottery and this is what you did, mm -hmm. right? And how many yeah. times have we like gotten through our day and like, what happened? Like, or the whole week, right? 
And yeah. like, what happened? Was I intentional? Mm. And, and one of my, it's interesting, the two top coaching platforms, I would argue the two top coaching platforms right now in the entrepreneurial community are Reboot and Conscious Leadership Group. Mm, and mm -hmm. whenever you hear the phrase conscious leadership group, you're like, oh my God, they're like, this is that group that goes out and hugs trees. No. Like rule number one is, you know, I commit to being curious. So they wrote a book called the 15. So here's a little thing for the day. 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. One of the best books ever. The guys at Coinbase, Pinterest, Genentech, they're all CLG disciples, or at least have had them in the shop. It's Darwinian. It's like, are you intentional as a firm? Are you open and transparent? Are you conscious in your decision? Not conscious as in like I'm connected to, you know, the, yes, I mean, you are, you know, are you, these things happen through you, et cetera, all that fun stuff. But are you doing things intentionally and thoughtfully at the end of the day? Um, and so the rules are very Darwinian. Let's be honest. What I love about venture, unlike, you know, cash flowing businesses, Darwin always shows up and he asks, poor Darwin. Um, anyway, so he asks, um, are you fundamentally building a business here? Or, you know, and what are the, and, and always looking for the Achilles heel. And so rule number one of like conscious leadership is, am I curious or at, do I fight to be right? Yeah. Right? Mm, and so, good. yeah. So I was with one of my CEOs and um, we just lost a sale. We have 99 candidates in the pipeline. We've been working this one for three months. And you know, the, the Buddha, well, the, the Buddha story, the two arrows, the first one's the disappointment that happens. The second arrow is, right? Yes, the story yes, yes, absolutely. So the first error was we lost a customer. Not great, but we've got 98 others. Well, Sunday night, we had interviewed 100 entrepreneurs and we said, how do you want your VC to show up? They were like, it's so lonely on a Sunday night. Help me deal with my demons, right? Mm. Number one, by far. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. Interesting, interesting. And, and so what, what, what happened? Oh my God, we lost this customer. We're going to lose the other customers. If we lose these other customers, um, I'm going to have to let people go. If I have to let people go, he's pregnant, she's or she's pregnant, they blah, 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 blah. Oh my God, my wife is going to look at me differently. My father, it's oh, by the way, Jungian analysis, as you know, Brie is like first seven years. So my father always told me I never amount to a thing. I, da, 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 da. Those old inner critics coming up. The inner critics, the the shadow playing, the are you above the line abundance or below the line scarcity, right? And so by the time we're done, I might as well just take the write off on the firm, right? It's like <laughs> it's done, it's over. Like we lost just one customer. Like Katie bar the door. Absolute nervous wreck. Curiosity. I said, well, hey, here's another one. Let's do curiosity. Let's go from, I need to be right. I need to show strength. I can't be vulnerable, all this kind of stuff, which how many times have you been in a discussion with someone where it's very clear that I'm even listening, right? Their hey, ego anyway, is all uh, around. <laughs> and, and by the way, the only reason I bring this up is not to be touchy feely. It is because if you don't have this dialogue, Darwin's going to show up and say, actually, the real answer is B, you've been trying to be right, A, and I'm or mm -hmm. we can address what's really in front of us and you know, be reactive and be curious. And oh, by the way, when you go into scarcity mode and all that, your amygdala fires, which means your prefrontal cortex literally shuts down all the neuroscience, Richie Davis and all that kind of stuff. You are unable to do abstract thinking. It literally cannot do it. All you are is I'm going to die, what can I do? right? That is not how you build a company at the end of the day. Sure. So this right. cascade occurs. Um, so, uh, so I said, well, let's, let's kind of take a step back. The fourth level of like motivation above, ex you know, there's external, there's amygdala, external validation, there's uh, internal, val external validation, internal purpose, no one knows what the hell their purpose is. So that one's kind of useless playfulness and curiosity 
love. Like, I love what I do. I don't really like, I'm just in bliss, like Roger Federer, like, you know, in the zone. And so playfulness, I said, let's approach playfulness. Like, whoa, 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 time out. Like, no, like this isn't a playground. This is like a venture company. I'm like, what can we learn? Let me replace playfulness with curiosity. Yeah. Huh. I want you to say the following quote. I thought they said this is you. I said, tell me the following. I want you to say the following quote. Ain't that a fucking hoot? <laughs> I'll say Ain't it. That Ain't a, that a fucking hoot? Ain't, Ain't that, that a, fucking, a hoot. fucking hoot? We spent three months in that customer. <laughs> Holy shit. We lost them. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. And they always say there's a fine line between drama and, tra- and comedy, right? So I'm like, okay, now what's the follow on after Ain't That a Fucking Hoot? Like, oh my God, we spent all this time. Great. What did we learn? Oh, well, we learned we can't do this, 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 and this. We got to improve our product. We got to do this. Oh, holy shit. We got 98 other customers. We can take the learnings from here, apply them to the 38. I'm going to go back to the product team. We're going to redo the. I'm like, wait, didn't you say that playfulness and curiosity and whatever is like not, has no place whatsoever in the startup, that it has to be serious and oh my God, we got to go below the line, place of fear. Yeah. What's, what's, what's going on here? Because I don't know what the fuck just happened, but I'm going to talk to the product team. And lo and behold, complete churn on the product, went out, closed the next 10 customers and the sales started to do this. Yeah. And I'm like, what if you approach your life like that? And this goes back to the St. Petersburg, mm. the St. Peter's test, right? Which is if you go up and talk to the, the big guy at the end of the day and said, okay, I was stressed out beyond belief. I wasn't curious. I was in my, I was below, this is conscious leadership groups, like above the line, below the line, right? So it's like, I was below the line. I wasn't curious. I wasn't thinking through. I was just all around survival and ego and all this other stuff. And the company went under. Um, and I tell you, the CEO still to this day is like, I'm not really certain what the fuck happened that day, but um, wow. And this is a direct result of one thing we didn't talk about in the pre thing is I had my Jerry Maguire moment. Um, you know, you're like, oh, I love to hear. Oh that. yes, yeah, of course. Story here. Of course. The Jerry Maguire moment was, so I've been doing venture for 27 years. And, um, and by the way, one of my like three mentors is my operating partner, Carter Cast. So I'm gonna give this to a shout out to Carter, um, it, even if he doesn't hear this. But you know, Carter's comment is he goes, you know, Marcus Rails, all the guys said, every morning I try and get up with less ego. Okay. When ego kicks in, you, you have to have some ego. I mean, ego plays a key role here. You don't want like people say, no, no, we, no, that's that, not in the venture world. But um, you've got to dial it back. Right? Sure. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, it, you know, every day the notion is, can I become 1% better than the version I was the day before? Yep. Um, and then I'm trying to remember what I, I have like a squirrel issue. Like my, my strength is orthogonal. Thing. No, 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 no. You're, you're, it's fantastic. Sure. No, it's fantastic. Okay. Well, so I have a question though. I have a question, Matt. Uh, when, when I was in college, I, I was studying, uh, I really, you know, my dad's a systems architect. He was, he was a, a hardcore coder, a very technical uh, co-founder. Um and so I had this expectation that I wanted to be a, a, a computer scientist or an engineer like him. That was what I was going to major in. So I, I went off to Vassar, thought I was going to do this joint degree with, with Vassar and Dartmouth in computer science and, uh, and, and math. And that was going to be my thing. I got, to dif- <laughs> I got, I got <laughs> to differential equations in math. And uh, I, I believe I got into operating systems in, in the computer science. So that was as high as I got. And I realized very quickly that I was not, uh, I was not that person. I was not the person behind the laptop, you know, coding away, 
Um, and that the real value that I could provide people was uh, to help founders kind of communicate the value that they were creating for people uh, and for their end user. Um, that was my kind of Jerry Maguire aha moment of sorts. Uh, I'm interested because everything that you're saying, plus the fact that this man has a master's in manufacturing management from Northwestern, uh, would would gear itself towards you being the best operator on the planet for any number of startups that are coming out. Where was the aha moment? Where was the Jerry Maguire moment that said, okay, this is why I'm going to be a venture capitalist, right? This is this is the moment where I'm going to invest in startups rather than start my own. So, by the way, this is what's really interesting about ego, right? Which is, what did ego say to you? To be respected, to be loved, to be whatever. I need to get, by the way, Carter has a great quote. He always says, behind every successful CEO is a six-year-old trying to get their parents' approval. <laughs> Which after three, so one of my four coaching modalities is NLP, the Tony Robbins into the, like literally again to the head. Sure. It always starts, it like literally the algorithms that drive our lives. And, and to your point, Bree, Carl Jung always said, if you don't make the subconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you'll call it fate. What is he talking about? He was talking about, he's the one who coined the phrase, the shadow, the first seven years, the algorithms right that form and if you're not aware self-aware if ego is like no no don't look in that corner don't do this we have to be right i have to get my parents approval i have to be a computer science major i have to be whatever right um my son has lyme disease as is my daughter and it is brutal and um here's what's interesting I'll, again personal vulnerable moment here it has been three years of hell Absolutely. Like when you have Lyme disease, everything's inflamed and it's like having flu 24 yeah. seven. He was at SMU before SMU. He was the Illinois state golf champion. Wow. He loves golf. He is so curious about golf. He doesn't play golf because he has to like prove himself. It's just, he will spend three hours in the driving range with a seven iron and just be absolutely enthralled with how the ball moves and all of that. Right. Yeah. As a result, uh, PGA has said you'd have the second fastest swing speed on the tour right now. But what did he do? He went to Oracle, enterprise selling, 6'5", blonde hair, blue eyed, crushing it, gets Lyme disease, strips all that away. Amor Fati. For, you know, woe is me. He says greatest gift ever in his life because he's like, why am I doing enterprise selling at Oracle? I'm good at it. I can make money at it. But my passion is golf. Yeah. And he played with Deschambeau. At yeah. SMU, who's, you know, on the Ryder Cup team, everything like that. Yeah, yeah. And he's plus five handicap, plus six handicap. And average drives 350, you know, that kind of thing. And he's like, when I get better, I'm going to make around the PGA Tour. Right? That kind of thing. But what does ego do to us? Ego says, you need to do this. And usually around age 40, 45, you take the red pill, see the matrix. It's also, by the way, and so there's a group I have of us that are, have been successful, we call it the Karma Club. And it's, we realized that we were in the matrix and it was all around dopamine dog biscuits. I no. need to go to, I just get one varsity letter. I got 10 varsity letters. I didn't just get one prize. I literally got almost every department prize at Kate. And in fact, history I got twice, yeah. right? It was, a, it, you know, I went to Williams and I'm one cop. Yeah, I went to BCG. I, it's it, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. The problem is everyone listening, it gets exponential. Yeah. And you're not, you're doing it from a place of dopamine, right? I want to feel good about versus oxytocin, right? And so eventually why is like 40 to 50, like the death valley of marriages and careers and all this stuff? Because as it gets so exponential, 
you're like, I can't do this anymore. Mm. And then nature, then the universe comes in and says, I've been telling you this for about 20 years now. This is what we're going to do. And my son just happened to have it happen when he was 23. Sure. Right. Sure. Who knows at the end of the day, by the way, what's going to happen with his, his journey. Sure. But my, it, so it was interesting for me is on the venture side, um, I'm at a point now where I think I've had 27 years and, and this is the, by the way, I'm, I'm going to self proclaim this is ego talking now for the next like 30 seconds here. So like 30% IRR, like seven unicorns, two decacorns, blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's all great. Right. Um, but I had a moment, I won't say which one of them, but had just sold in 2015, my Jerry McGuire and I would just sold one of our companies for a, a unicorn valuation. And everyone's like, oh my God, the second largest exit and blah, blah, blah. I was numb. Yeah. As a VC, that is, <laughs> that's not a good thing. Now, Bree, like, you know, the assessment thing, like I know my Hogan assessment is, I am low on money and low on power and high on affiliation. And like, it was a whole host of things like what drives me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I can't literally cannot keep doing the, I'm going to do this just to feed my ego. And that's when I started doing the coaching training. Like I need to, I also would say that there are kind of two groups of skills that help entrepreneurs. They're the tactical stuff. And we've built that Pritzker with, you know, Carter and everyone. So this Carter you hear is, you know, took walmart.com from zero to five billion, turned down Cheryl Sandberg's job, CMO of eBay, built Blue Nile, like blah, blah, blah. Leone, Door, I don't, Kegel, I don't know if you've heard any of these guys, uh, Leone, these are all the We've same. all heard of them, yeah. <laughs> this is Carter, right? Yeah. So, um, so, sorry, Carter, if I'm mentioning you here on this one. But, um, you know, you begin to realize in very short order that you get on this hamster wheel and you actually get, so in 2015, I had my exit moment, right? It was my, I don't know, my sixth unicorn or whatever. And I didn't really feel anything. And I thought, this isn't good. And I thought, well, what would feel good? I'm like, if I could actually help them on the journey. And so the reason I was bringing up Carter and everything is we actually at Frisco built out 180 modules. So Carter's one of the, I think arguably one of the, in Schoenthal and a bunch of others, like the top professor at Kellogg. And it was, we literally created these 180 modules on, you want to do go to market, you want to do value prop, you want to do whatever. Here's literally the 10 slide deck. Here's the exercise you do. Interview the entrepreneurs and they're talking about, it's so hard being an entrepreneur, make me a superhero. They're talking about who can I talk to on a Sunday night when the demons and the shadows from my fifth grade, my third grade impeachment are coming up, right? All that sure. stuff. Yeah. That is not VC. VCs don't do that. No, no, no. Yeah. That's reboot, whatever. And so that's when I started formulating this idea so that my personal vehicle I invest out of is called Forge Capital, which is the idea of Forge is personal growth and excellence are forged in the fires of entrepreneurship. Hmm. like never waste a good crisis right yeah. when do you grow during crisis yeah have you ever met an entrepreneur where it's not just literally five years of crisis right <sighs> not it's at a all tough roller it's a roller coaster well and and speaking of crisis i mean we've just gone through this massive worldwide crisis of covid19 and I'm reminded of your background right now and watching on YouTube. Uh, Matt has a beautiful green pasture behind him with a rainbow coming out. And I think there are two, two dogs also maybe somewhere behind Matt in, in this photo. Um, how did you... How did you spend the crisis with your family? Where did you spend it? And... Uh, I mean, I think the value in it for me, selfishly, is that you have seen so many different cycles of the markets, of life, 
so I want to know how you kind of with with your background and this way of thinking kind of approach the pandemic and and how did you create kind of personal growth? The Jerry Maguire moment I had when that sale occurred was what would make this a lot more meaningful and what what would make it a lot more meaningful would be if I was able to bring the stuff that really mattered. Who can I turn to on a Sunday night? How can I be the highest version of myself? When I go from five, 5 million to 10 million to 20 million to 100 million, oh my God, every night I go home and I'm like, I can't do this, right? Yeah. What if you took Reboot or Consolidation Grow or any of these other coaching platforms and had a love child with a venture firm, what would it look like? Um, what if you took the 180 modules on how to go to market and whatever and combined it with how do you set culture? How do you do self-assessments? How do you do all the kind of stuff that really matters, right? Sure. Um, what would that look like? And that was kind of like I've been playing with is on Forge Capital. That's the notion behind it. And so I've been taking the, in 2015, I started doing coaching programs. So CLG, NLP, CTI, they're all three letters. Um, and the acronyms. And the idea was how to live a good life. Marcus Aurelius, right? Philosophy is only good when applied in the day-to-day -day life and making an impact, mm -hmm. right? If you live a better life, if you're happier or more content, you know, my, the only tattoo I have is, whoop, there we go, Arate, the Aristotle concept of excellence, the highest version of yourself, right? Um, well, what if you could combine those two and as a result, in, actually enjoy the entrepreneurial journey? And I thought, oh my God, if I start going down this path, I am never going to see a deal as long as I live. I'm literally going to see every single sustainability plan. I'm going to see every solar plan, <laughs> right? There's a tree, go over You'll there. You'll be labeled. Yes. Okay. I'm going to be labeled. And so I thought so much for the venture career, but feels good. Sure. Next deal that I did, and that was a later stage, but was Coinbase and P44. And, and suddenly like the deals that were here were now here. And I'm like, mm. wait a second. Wait, I, I like started to lean into my Jerry Maguire moment and the deals actually got better. Like how I call it Reese's peanut butter cup, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like all great ideas are like two evolutionary things that come together. They've just never played. And so I really started to lean into with the Gen Z's and the millennials and all of this. Right. And, and by the way, we've been through COVID, but let's be honest, all COVID did was accelerate sure. the Absolutely. venture the companies. Absolutely. And by the way, I haven't seen a company go under in four years. Have you? Yeah. I, I literally, I have not seen we're talking about historically 40 to 50% go under. Right. Sure. That is weird. So well, I, yeah, absolutely. So we're about to see the blue ribbon from all of these type mm. A ego driven, whatever, like this, what we're talking about here, the punch bowls will, get, will eventually get taken away. Mm. And the stuff we're talking about is now going to come roaring to the front. And by the way, that's when the best companies are started. So I don't want this to be a depressive talk here as much as to say, we're gonna see some amazing companies get formed here, but yeah, I will tell you yeah. that if your game is the momentum investing that I put money in a 10X multiple and now it's 20 times revenue and now it's 40 times revenue and I'm a really smart person. Yeah. That's reversing yeah. now. Well, so, okay, right. so now we're gonna get into the business side of these things and um... I, I'm actually really excited to get your thoughts on this. And it, it dovetails off of my last question. Um, you know, I, I think the R word of recession has been thrown uh, recently. Um, you have been an investor long enough to invest at up and down cycles. Um, what, and I love that, that last hot take that you just gave us um, to investors that, um, were momentum investors. L let's talk about what advice you have for investors in this market with the recession kind of looming, whether it happens or not, and for how long, we don't know. But what advice do you have for, for
for investors in that case. And also, what are you? What is your thinking about how LPs kind of react in that market, and are they kind of counterbalanced with one another? So I'm going to pivot the question. So, like, having been a former politician, that yes, was yeah, out yes, early on, but um, <laughs> my friends who are politicians are like whatever the question is, answer what you want to answer. And like, it's not, so the question I'm gonna ask is how would I answer that for entrepreneurs, not for VCs? Um, VCs are gonna figure it out the hard way. Um, And first of all, who knows, this could be another three years of this, right? So I I mean, there's so much capital out there right now, but multiples have gone from 27 to 16 or I mean, whatever, right? So they're already compressing, which means that'll filter back down. But um, the real question is, as an entrepreneur, how would I be thinking about managing my business? Yeah. Um, number one is uh, what I learned about dollar. So we were the seed investor, dollar, one, a seed investor at Dollar Shave Club, right? And one thing I learned is when the fundamentals are there, yeah, it makes all the sense in the world to pour gasoline. So we were like $50 million round, $50 million round. And, and we did what I never thought was possible, which we took 25% market share from Gillette, right? But the numbers worked. So this is not a, so yes, number one, don't go bankrupt. As John, as uh, Don Valentine, the founder of Sequoia said, all companies die for the same reason. They run out of fucking cash. Yeah. <laughs> or to use it the way he says, they run out of fucking cash. Um, anyways, um, so don't be stupid. But if your fundamentals are there, yeah, don't you know, uh, don't pull back the horns and all that. However, most businesses right now, um, most people in the business have not seen a downturn. Yeah. Right, 2008 was the last downturn. It should have been 2015, 2016, and the Fed jumped in. Right. So I would argue that that cycle ended, and we're now seven years into the next, eight years into the next cycle, which should be 22, 23. Um, I have no idea how it's going to play out or unwind, but in terms of fundamentals, um, it's around know your customer, know your value prop. Um, the great companies are built in downturns because in a place where you don't have resources, you get maniacally focused on what does the customer want. Yeah. Um, if you look at the Fortune 500, the lion's share of them got started in downturns yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Right. So um, I would say with entrepreneurs is be really careful while you're doing this, because if there is a downturn and I don't know when, I mean, I'm not here to like pour water on this and I'm seeing the RIP good times stuff already occurring. It's, right. it's circulating. Yeah. Right. But uh, I, I don't, I think that's a little bit of an overreach, but um, if you're doing it for ego, if you're doing it because you want the upper round, if you're doing it because you want the other entrepreneurs to, to, it's like the equivalent of me playing tennis and doing it because I want to win tournaments versus yeah. I love, like my son, right? He loves golf. Yeah. Um, more importantly, like there's a mission that you have. The like, number one thing we look for in entrepreneurs is have you lived the problem and is there an evil in the world that you have lived that you want obliterated? Yeah. Because when the market downdrafts, that's, you're still driven by this evil needs. So for me, it's like having grown up with a single mom who just like 30 years too early, that's not going away, yeah. right? That's not ego. That is like the world needs to be a different place. So my two daughters, how do I want the world to be different for them? And I would say with entrepreneurs, be crystal clear on your origin story, the emotion behind it, how you want the world to change. And therefore, What's your, what is your brand promise? Mm-hmm. What's your value prop and brand promise? And more importantly, what are the proof points? How are you going to show up differently? If you focus on that, everyone else is going to go under. And you're literally going to iterate on, there literally it comes down to three words, right? Usually most brand promises are like three words. And they go, usually go back to some origin story like, I remember when Aunt Susie blank, right? And they never forget it. And so even though the market, it could, I mean, it could just continue this or it could do this. It doesn't fucking matter, right? It's it's the hero's journey. So, you know, everyone has their problem, their call. They take their call. Now, my question for you, Matt, has have you read the heroine's journey? 
Oh my God, who, no, what, please. Cause yeah, way, I'll send you the book. Is, she, she was, she wrote it. She learned about, it was a UCLA professor who worked with Joseph Campbell and she wrote the heroine's journey in 1990. Oh my God. So, Ooh. so first of all, th I mean, he is, so if I think about all the philosophers, he is my, my Northern star. Cause my mom went to Sarah Lawrence when he was teaching there. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I've done so many talks on the entrepreneur's journey, but I would love this. The, I would. So what is, so Brie, what is the, um, what would you say is the delta on the heroine's journey? So it's about rejecting the relationship with your mother. It's, it's a lot of it is rejecting the feminine, um, embracing the masculine, and then reintegrating the feminine into your psyche, because a lot of women, um, they push away from their mother and their relationship with their mother, just like men push away from their father, right? The Oedipus mm -hmm. um, complex. Mm -hmm. So it's just a similar thing. It's just, it's with the mother. I'll send you the cycle. I have it. I would it's, love, and, and by little... the way, post it, by the way, post it as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll this? post it on LinkedIn. Oh, and on this too. Yeah, I love it. it we'll, we'll put it, Josh will put it in the uh, episode description here. I, I think we're going to have the most link twos of any episode <laughs> we've ever done based on this, this one conversation with Matt, which by the way, uh, we're going to have, I already have told myself in the back of my head that we're having Matt back on uh, another time so that we can discuss everything else that we didn't cover. And we still have a little bit more time here, but we're going to have you back on, Matt, and you're going to say yes, and you're going to come back on. We're going to talk about all the things we didn't cover. So anyway, you are, um, you're too kind. Well, we were talking, so we were talking about the entrepreneurial journey, and I think the entrepreneurial journey has been accelerated in a lot of ways. Um, one of the ways that we've seen it uh, be accelerated is, you know, right up front and top of mind for me today and for many VCs today. I mean, today is uh, YC winner batch 21 day two for demo day, right? There were 414 companies in their cohort that presented over the last two days. And all um, of them were 15 pre. Yeah. Did, by the way, did you, did you cover it or did you have an associate or a principal cover it? No, I sit in, I sit on them and, okay. and, and we've had some phenomenal, whether it's Coinbase or drone base or whatever come out of there. But yeah, I mean, it's, sure. On one hand, I'm like, yeah, let entrepreneurship bloom. Yeah. yeah. Um, but holy moly, I mean, that is a lot of people at 15 pre. Well, yeah. And so, okay, look, whenever you have success, there's going to be some pressure to scale that even further, right? So Stripe, Coinbase, Instacart, Airbnb, YC has done it all, right? It is golden child with 66 unicorns and it's probably growing from that. Um <laughs> When I was watching the first batches in my very young career in venture capital, it was 20 to 30 companies per batch uh, at, at max. Um, can I, I just want to get your take on what this means for people, right? I, by the way, they've also started investing 500K, which is much higher than they initially invested in each company back in the day. Um, I just want to get your sense of what is what's your take on that trajectory? Is it sustainable? Is it good? Is it bad for venture? What do you think? So what's interesting is like, for example, um, I was involved in, in the discussions about launching the third tech stars. Yeah. Third, third, we were and literally the discussion was, well, they're only four quarters in the year. So like, we can't like double up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now like the JP Morgan announcement, like let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, how do I think about this? Um, so I was on a panel with one of the, the original founders of 500 startups and someone in the audience from Wall Street Journal said to us, I actually said to them, um, how can you, it was hilarious the way they phrased it. It wasn't like a, a non bark It was like, how can you sleep at night yeah. knowing that you were launching 500 companies and they're going to go to their death? Yeah. And I was like, well, wow, that's certainly a little bit of an edge on that question. <laughs> right? It's like, like, what do you think about XYZ? And it was like, to their death, 500 people going to their death. 
Yeah. And they looked right back at him and said, so if the company fails, is someone going to put a, take him out back and put a bullet in their head? And the Wall Street Journal was like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, so you tell me, Socratic questions, right? You tell me, how's this going to play out? Sure. What are they going to sure. do? Sure. Oh, they'll probably go back to Google or they'll go back to whatever. Or they'll do another startup. Great. Yeah. And yeah. when they do that, same person. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait, if they do a second startup, are they going to do the same issue again? Mm -hmm. No. If they're at Google, are they like going to bring wisdom back to Google and all the tech engineers who have never done it? Sure. Yes. So wait, so you're telling me I'm literally going to educate 500 people on life and entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial and innovative thinking and dot, dot, dot. And some of them will succeed in this context. Others will take that wisdom and apply it over here. Yes. And then the, the drop, the question was, so is this a bad thing? And the <laughs> Wall Street Journal said, article, the art said, I think it's actually a pretty good thing. I'm yeah. like, what if? every single person knew to Bree's point the hero's journey and yeah. the crossing the threshold and into the forest and facing your your dragon pushing through the dragon and bringing the wisdom back would sure. the world be a better place or sure. playing safe not facing your dragons and as a result of that not growing i think that's the best I think you've articulated the counterpoint to what I'm about to say better than anyone I've ever heard say. It. Uh, <laughs> here's here's the counterpoint, if I may. And I think Brie knows that I like being the dumbest person at the table uh, at whatever I hope chance. So I beginner's get. mind. Yeah. No. I I think life is not meant to to be. Uh, it, you're not meant to be in a situation where you're the smartest and you know everything, right? The best VCs on the planet are those that listen the best, I think. But here's my counterpoint. And you, you tell me what you think about this. My feeling is, is that if you give an entrepreneur 500K for the first idea that they have, and you say, go, 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 go. You have to produce, you have to get traction, you have to get market fit. And you have to show numbers so that you hit some threshold that some VC out there is going to love. Right. Versus, hey, you know, you have a good idea, but iterate on that idea. Figure out, do some testing on that idea. See if that's right. Maybe you have to pivot. And by the way, pivot shouldn't be a shitty word that people throw out and say, oh, you pivoted. And because you pivoted, you're an asshole or you're a failure. Right. 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 So I think that, so a couple of things. Um, the outcome to the world, the outcome to the entrepreneur, I think is not going to change. The outcome yeah. to the investors will. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. If you invest in 400 companies at too high of a valuation or whatever. There's a possibility if the punch bowl gets taken away that there's going to, you know, there will be blood, yeah. right? However, if what, um, now I'm biased because I'm on the board at Kellogg and helped kind of with Carter and Schoenthal, a whole bunch of other folks mm -hmm. turn the entrepreneurial program around and the, the whole focus on that and Stanford's and others programs is entrepreneurship is relevant everywhere. It's relevant at the preschool, it's relevant at the startup, it's relevant in the family office, it's relevant within a corporation, right? Which is, mm -hmm. there is a thinking, a de design thinking, like jobs to be done, design thinking, you know, uh, fundamentals, how do you think about things? All of these things are skill sets I wish everyone had in their life. So if YC is literally just accelerating that and making certain everyone has those tools or the business schools are accelerating all that, the world is a better place. The investors are kind of shit out of luck, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, when, the, when the tide pulls back. But 
if you know going back to that notion of if there are 500 startups that have those in, those entrepreneurs have learned the fundamentals of entrepreneurship sure. the world's a better place yeah um i think that the the vintage year the venture vintage years are going to be pretty ugly mm. for the next couple of years you know this year and next year but yeah I mean, but you know I mean, look, long term, look, let's look long term, right? Yeah, Who cares? Yeah. I know I may sound critical of, of YC and, and that scale, um, but I think you present a very strong counterpoint to that. And I, it's really hard to argue, right? In the long term, I agree. I think the more entrepreneurs you have, the more people with entrepreneurial mindsets that you have, the better that this place is going to be. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. Doesn't so, mean that the IRR is going to be great. Sure. In terms of like financial return. Yeah. But for everyone else in the world, it's better. Yeah. Right. Um, and I'm in. And if you look at TechStars, if you look at YC, if you look at some of these programs, they've got some great. Like I'm co-teaching um, right now entrepreneurship. Uh, Mike, there's a class I'm involved with, and Dave Brown, the co-founder of TechStars, is teaching one of the others. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we're comparing notes, and like I know students in his class, and like, oh my god, this is like the best class I've ever had in the history of my education. Dave legend. Brown yeah, is yeah. right, legendary. Yeah. Um, it's so I would argue that those 50 students in his class, their lives will be better. But yeah, no. And and a quick shout out, by the way, uh, you know, Techstars is fantastic. There's a a program that I'm involved with uh, that Techstars put on um, and uh, it's called the Industries of the Future. And I might have butchered that. Uh, I'm a mentor, (laughs) though, for Oak Ridge, Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, this is not... Silicon Valley. This is not a New York. Oh, wait, this whoa, is not whoa, even whoa. LA. Let's back up. Like, so you threw that out there, but so tell, like, say a little bit about what is Oak Ridge. <laughs> I, Oak Ridge, <laughs> Knoxville, uh, Tennessee. I, I don't think it's known by the majority of people uh, on the coast as a uh, a land of entrepreneurial empowerment or you know with an ecosystem to really support kind of really interesting startups etc but what i think you've seen in oak ridge uh is a um a ton of organizations that have gotten together and have said let us promote um entrepreneurship and let us use our kind of power and our um, space in this ecosystem to to push entrepreneurs to come here or to remain here in Oak Ridge, Knoxville, Tennessee and um, and start their businesses right And so absent of a um, a, a fully grown or or uh, fully realized ecosystem of mentors and investors, et cetera. They're saying let's let's take our corporations and let's try and accelerate entrepreneurship in our area. Well, and by the way, this goes back to thanks to COVID, entrepreneurship everywhere. But right now, one of the hottest cities is or one of the hottest states is now is Tennessee. Yeah. Some of our biggest hits, like one of our seed deals, freight waves. Yeah. Like whether it's healthcare because of HCA or logistics, it's, I mean, Tennessee right now is grand zero. Anyway, I'm yeah. sorry to die. No, I mean, that. look, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think Tennessee is a great. And there's also Oak Ridge National Lab, right? The only reason so, I'm bringing that up is you had Oak Ridge National Lab, which means you have massive federal funding going in there. That's right. So you have Oak Ridge National Laboratory, you've got Tennessee Valley Authority, you've got University of Tennessee, um, you've got, um, oh gosh, I, I know I'm butchering this because there, there are a number of organizations that support this and I'm 
who am I? I'm a mentor for a program, right? But um, yeah, you've you've got massive funding, uh, both government and corporate funding, that's going towards these entrepreneurs in a fantastic way, right? And these are all entrepreneurs that are focused on frontier tech and utilizing frontier tech, deep tech, AI, machine learning, robotics, et cetera. And so um, it's really a fantastic program. And it speaks to the fact that um, the entrepreneurial journey is not just accelerating due to the pandemic, like you were saying, Matt, but um, I think another point that you're alluding to is it's accelerating because all these different geographies are now joining in on the the fun, right? The, this this excitement around how do we build new industries in these predominantly old kind of antiquated areas. So one of the so if I think about kind of the, some of the key frameworks that I think about in terms of how to approach new markets. So I headed up our crypto efforts, launched LA, whatever, right? Um, and I have a whole deck, a whole methodology on how do you launch a new uh, sector, geography, whatever, right? Um, and one of uh, a friend of mine, friend of Pritzker, friend of whatever, is a guy named Keith Ferrazzi, who's in LA. Uh, wrote Love a book. Keith Ferrazzi. Yes. <laughs> Never eat alone. Out. He's the best. The number, the first session. So at Stanford, the the deity class is the power class by Jeffrey Pfeiffer. Class one, Keith Ferrazzi, Never Eat Alone. I just was uh, talking about him to my team on Monday. I was saying, if you haven't read Never Eat Alone, read it because you should have a lunch every week with someone now that we're open back up. <laughs> so Bree, you just keep like running the, the, the score up here. Um, it's incredible. Win so, so Keith, uh, so we were trying to think through like for venture, go to market strategies. And this is whether it's, you know, so this is more on the VC side of the world. And so Keith said, fine, you know, like Keith, you know, the Keith and every alone, one of the things is like never it alone, but every time you meet someone, the Karma Club, leave the campground cleaner then when you arrived mm -hmm. and good things will happen right so keith said come on in i'm literally going to show you all my back-end systems i'm going to show you how i approach things i'm going to show you how i would go to market and so everything we do is literally been like mentored by keith Ferrazzi. he keynoted our ceo summit the whole bit and one of the concepts that Keith lays out is you look at the ecosystem and you identify who are the key nodes. There may be, so when we, when we launched the West Coast presence for us, um, we literally created a database of 2000 people. Mm. And in the 2000 people in, La and this is just Los Angeles, mm -hmm. of the 2000, who are the 20 people that touched everyone? Who are the key nodes? Who are the power nodes? Uh huh. But then you have to authentically engage with them and leave the campground cleaner. So wait, how did you first get the data? And then who are the 20 that you found? Ooh, can you, can you reveal the 20? Mm -hmm. So, it so first you. of all, the, so the methodology is very, I mean, like the approach is very simple, which is you start to go into the ecosystem, you start talking to people and you say, who are the keynotes? Who are the people you respect? This, literally, this is page rank. This is Google. Who do I need rank. to know? Yeah, who do I need to know? And what you begin to hear is the same names coming up over and over and over again. Um, by the way, shout out to Brooklyn. I've seen multiple players doing what Brooklyn, Brooklyn is doing. I was absolutely blown away by if it you i can't believe you haven't done the shout out like go to our website look at all of our models our classes everything like if any entrepreneur is listening to this holy moly like there is no one like brooklyn who has like laid this stuff out um, thank you that is our strategy i'm we're trying to provide knowledge to all of our entrepreneurs 
and as a result, leave the campground cleaner, right? Absolutely. And, and much like, like, you know, my Jerry Maguire moment. So this is what I say to every business school student, anyone I ever talked to is I was like, you're, if you're thinking about your career, so here we go. Uh, Uncle Matt is talking about career management. By the way, I have a whole deck on this. Um, and I'll link to it, by the way, in our <laughs> podcast, because I happen to have a 19 year old, a 23 year old, and a 20. So this is like, I've like, here, you guys do it. And they, of course, they don't listen to me, but, um, you know, the ferocity approach is very simple, which is never eat alone, always leave the campground cleaner than every time you meet with someone. Don't ask what's in it for me. Yeah. Ask how can I make this a better place? How can I help you? Karma, karma exists. The reason I've been in this business 27 years and to your earlier point, there's one thing that I, that I well, ah, shit, I'll say it. Um, so if you actually do the analysis, forget the fact that the Fed is protected from the last since 2008, but literally every eight years, what happens with the LPs is there's a downturn, the LPs pull back. I kid you not, every venture group in the region wiped out. Gonzo. And, and we're talking like even like, I mean, Kleiner was on death's door, right? I mean, remember Kleiner made a bet and everyone thought they were gone and then they reconstituted. And I like hats up to the current management, John Doerr, deity, it's that generational succession, whatever. But what sure. happened was, what happens is the LPs pull back and everything gets wiped out. So I came into the business the same time that Brad Feld came in and Fred Wilson came in, Jerry Colon at Reboot came in, a whole bunch of us, right? The folks that have generally survived have either been exceptional at you know, whatever the hell they do, and they just stay ahead of Darwin. But the, guy, the folks that have done it in the most effortless way, you know, Bradfield's a you know, buddy, whatever. It, it, it same with Jerry, you know, with uh, Fred Wilson. Fred Wilson was at Flatiron, Flatiron Toast. Yeah. Gonzo, in 99, 2000, they were the bell of the ball. Wiped out by 2001, 2002. Fred reconstituted USV and Kelowna, Jerry just went and he'll tell, I mean, this is not like he went into like almost like a suicidal, like just depression, Pima Chodra and the whole bit. And then came out the other side and created a reboot. But I would argue that if you want to have a long-term career in entrepreneurship and venture and anything, be really careful why you're doing it, what mm -hmm. motivates you. And, um, and who's around you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what's going on? Because I kid you not. So look at Los Angeles, look at Chicago, look at any market. Go back to 1995, look at 2003, look at 2010, and look at the most active VC firms. Literally none, of, almost none of them make the transition. Mm -hmm. right. But they reconstitute and they reform. Right. Rick Smith was the guy who, who made it through most of those who we've had on the show before. That's right. That's right. And Rick is awesome. And Brett Brewer from MySpace oh. and Brian mm -hmm. Garrett. Like, All the cross like, tech guys. Awesome. And yeah. Uh, oh, you know, I, um, I wanted to ask you actually to kind of go back to storytelling and the atmosphere we're in, we have a, a huge slew of movies that are on, you know, Travis at Uber, WeWork, Bad Blood, uh, the, the Elizabeth Holmes, you know, Hulu series. What do you think about Hollywood's new interest in some of our biggest entrepreneurs? And their failures. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's going to hurt? Because it's, there's, I feel like there was a huge influx of of entrepreneurs if you will after you know everyone watched mm -hmm. facebook movie and they see this mark zuckerberg rise um and now yep. everyone wants to be the next mark zuckerberg right but now we're seeing like or do you want to be the next travis 
who, by the way, is not doing bad with Cloud Kitchen. I mean, it's not like he's failing, in my opinion. So, so a couple things. Um, one is we are currently watching the Hulu, like my kids and I are watching, and they are literally glued to the television. And all they do is they keep turning to me and say, so when I was at, uh, in DFJ, we were a seed investor at Theranos. Tim's mm. in the documentary. Like Tim Drake. Oh, yeah, in the I do remember yeah. that. Uh, and I also tell you that we, the DFJ, did not do a round after the seed. You kind of because... got her look going on right now, Matt. You got your Elizabeth Holmes look. <laughs> oh, stop! Stop! <laughs> stop! I'm sorry. No. 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 Okay. No, wait. No. So just to be clear, <laughs> if someone was to, I get the Steve Jobs reference. Every like once in a Jones while, ones. I get the Elizabeth Holmes. I'm going to go Steve you know, Jobs. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's sexist. You know, we got to give the, uh, the, the black you know, turtleneck some, some Elizabeth Holmes. Credit. Sex out the window. I really honestly think if anyone were to compare you so ever with Steve Jobs, they'd be so <laughs> far off. Right. I think there's a, a level of empathy that you have that I don't think uh, Steve Jobs could ever or would ever attribute himself to ever having, right? Or, or Elizabeth Holmes. Or <laughs> Elizabeth Holmes, you're right. Absolutely no, right. Steve, Absolutely so right. Let's, so but what Steve Jobs would say at the, the tail end was around <clears throat> living a good life, mm. right? And what drove him. And the things that often drive us are set early on in our lives. Sure. And if we're not, so, to go back to so i know a lot of entrepreneurs are watching this and we are like all over the place on this like i apologize because mm -hmm. i am like squirrel like I amazing am mr squirrel here that's why i'm good adventure but yeah. um oh so steve jobs if you think about it steve jobs would tell you that he was tortured right mm -hmm. early on he was an orphan right he was adopted not enough and so a lot of things that happened in his life were to prove that he was enough to that. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, the universe steps in. And so I go back to the synchronicity thing. He goes to Reed College, which is like the top place in the world for calligraphy. And that became the heart of Apple, was the calligraphy. Even though he was eating ramen noodles on the floor. Like what, part, pardon my French, but what the fuck? Like, yeah. seriously? Yeah. Like, um, and he drops that freshman year. So, he, but he would say that, or he has said, I'm not saying like, I'm literally, I'm not like a Steve Jobs whisperer. Um, but, you know, he would say that he was battling those demons sure. throughout. But the goal was, it's funny you mentioned Travis. I think, first of all, I think Travis is, an, uh, is a phenomenal entrepreneur. However, there's an element of the tortured entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Can you, so if I was to say, what is my mission in life? 27 years in, I look back. <clears throat> Number one is the VCs that survived in my pledge class. There are not a lot of us, to be honest, yeah. right? There is a commonality amongst us, which is, leave the campground cleaner than you started yeah brad feld will be immortal because not because of all of his deals and you it, brad could lay, lay out all of his deals anyone who's ever met brad feld leaves that saying he is such a good human being yeah i was gonna say kind of weird but yeah also good <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> I like Brad. Brad's really nice, but he's got his cool shirts. Um, he's he's a cool guy. The number one rule of venture is this: dramatic pause. Um, okay. Drum roll, please. So I'll do the touchy feely phrase, and then I'll explain it. Um, karma equals synchronicity. Now, what does that mean? Did I just hug a tree? No, um, I, we don't think you did. It is random acts of kindness done on a continual basis. We interviewed 100 entrepreneurs and they talked about different VCs. 
here was a phenomenal takeaway, a couple of like high level takeaways. And we're talking about like the cost flow all the way down to like, you know, the college student. They said, for example, we met Pete Fenton, benchmark. He came into the meeting. We just had a meeting with XYZ, I won't say the firm, XYZ firm. They were like, kiss the ring, be little people in front of the king, the whole bit. They were like, fuck you. They met with Pete, Pete Fenton, who came in with a lunch and said, oh my God, you don't have lunch? Like, I, Susan, come in here, like get them lunch, met with them, said, not for benchmark. However, here's my advice, A, B, C, D. Like, but it wasn't like, like I'm pontificating to you. It was A, B, C, D, as in like, I care about you. Yep. Let me connect you with the following CEO as a mentor. Mm. And they said that mentor changed the trajectory of their company, even though Benchmark never invested. Wow. To this yes. day, if any entrepreneur comes to them, they say, you need to talk to Pete Benton at Benchmark. So what's the takeaway from that is karmical synchronicity. Random acts of kindness done on a continual basis leads to someone saying to you, my brother's just leaving Square, Google, whatever, about to do a startup. I was just thinking of you because you're amazing and I trust you. Yep. And then synchronicity occurs, right? Don't and you, that's venture. Don't you think part of the reason though he was so successful at doing that is because they are intentional in the way they invest and they can give really good feedback to um, their startups. I feel like that's like a key component. It's huge. And if you think about like Fred Wilson, right? So, so here, like, I, by the way, I have like so many obnoxious quotes and whatever, I'll just like pontificate forever. But um, so when I was on the FeedBurner board, so I seated FeedBurner with Dick Oslo and then in came Brad the next round and then Fred did the next round. So I'm on a board with a blogging platform and they got me into blogging somethingventure.com. I haven't blogged in two years, but it's about to hit. Um, anyways, because GoDaddy blew my setup. Anyways, um, Brad's comment was, I blog because it allows people to see who I am. And, I, and they therefore don't even have to ask me the questions of who I am because it's authentically there already. Mm, mm-hmm. So that was a, a huge takeaway, which was if you blog, don't do it because of ego and pontificating, do it because you want to expose who you are, how you think, whatever. And then that allows people to self-select. Second yes. takeaway was Fred Wilson, who reaffirms the notion of thematic investing. So Fred yeah. blogs because, well, I mean, I, by the way, I'm not going to jump into like, what is Fred blog, but I would say that one thing I've observed about when I talk to Fred is, um, I want to be able to tell people, this is what I'm interested in, and this is what I'm not. And the more I tell you, this is what I'm interested in, I get the virtuous loop going, and I become a domain expert, and I get better and better and better at that. Yeah. Right. And then once I've defined what that is, I can go full on Keith Barazzi on it. And I put <laughs> everyone in the ecosystem. And if I was to give one piece of advice to, so if I say, what is like the guiding principle that, that when I think about building our operating platform and my discussion with my partners, when I think about coaching and the whole bit, is one simple moment of truth, which is, with one call, with one whatever, can you solve the issue the CEO is, do- is dealing with at that moment in time? Because if you, you can't, it's not like a zero. Like I'm like, how many, you know, the number of times I've been on a board and they're like, oh, you should talk to Fred or Susan or whatever. If they're doing it because they wanna seem important or value added, and the entrepreneur does it and it's a waste of time, it's not zero, it's minus one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I said, land 
so when I talk to our VPs and our partners, when I'm like, land the fucking punch. One call access, the problem goes away, plus one. Make the recommendation, feel good about your ego, your like the, the big person feeling good at, and it's a waste of time, literally minus one. They will not go back to you ever again for another idea. So the challenge I have right now with this whole idea of the forge concept of like coaching leads venture, this is complete new territory. So we always talk about to our entrepreneurs about there's a moment of truth when the entrepreneur tries your product. And if it's phenomenal, they tell their friend. So there's this notion of like, there's an expectation curve and entrepreneurship literally lives or dies based on this, uh, this Try to keep my arm from disappearing here. Thanks for the like. If you're above the expectation, people tell their friends. If you're below it, you're dead. dead. Right. So, what's really I call it, we call it the Dollar Shave database. Um, you know, we can talk a little about that. But literally, every company has ever come into our shop, we pull 15, 20 data points and then kind of lay them out. And two of the big ones are retention and organic and NPS, those three. Why? Because that tells you, are you delivering the punch? And if that happens, they come back over and over and over again and the lifetime value goes to the roof. What's funny is we interviewed a hundred entrepreneurs and we asked them, has anyone ever interviewed you? And they said, no. Like we're in the venture business for <laughs> pontificating to our entrepreneurs, like know your customer. And none of us are asking an entrepreneur what they want other than like first. I mean, there are, there are a couple of folks that are just sure. fucking rock and roll. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a, it's a very, very interesting situation. Um, so. What, um, one thing that comes to mind, by the way, um, I don't know if you're big into memes, Matt. But if there was ever a meme for, say, you are an orthogonal thinker without saying you're an orthogonal thinker, I've just pointed to like the last 20 minutes of our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, By you... the way, they, they say the success of venture is thinking differently from everyone else. And yeah. being right thinking differently from everyone else and being wrong guess what you're screwed and the other by the word word of wisdom came from my former partner steve jervinson which is if everyone can see it yeah. it's not the revolution okay 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 so giving given that if you are very good and i think you are very good at pattern recognition brie thinks you're very good at pattern recognition <laughs> um do you think that Pattern recognition can be taught, can be learned. I think listening can be taught. Um, I was very lucky early in my career because we had a fund to funds component. So at any point in time, I had every quarter 600 portfolio companies. And I literally reconstructed all of them as if they were in our portfolio five storage companies and four blew up and one didn't this goes back to the whole curiosity component so i think yeah. if you do two things which is put yourself in a place with the most data streams number one and you combine it with um curiosity versus like i have to be right and whatever and then add the keith ferrazzi element of like never eat alone and network 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 and make the world a better place it's a huge component of success in the venture business. Yeah. So um, kind of to piggyback off that question, um, if let's just say pattern recognition is a neurological, um, I guess, advantage from birth, okay? Um, I know you're into biohacking. <laughs> Um, have you found anything that could perhaps, or what, what have you experimented with? And is there anything that could perhaps 
give someone a little boost in the pattern recognition area? So at a high level of curiosity, like just being curious about things and like, why did that happen? Like, so if you do the five why questions, like why, 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 why? Um, more importantly, like that worked, that didn't. Why? Hugely powerful. Um, I think we have a lot of AI elements in us that work against us, right? That started when we were, so Jerry Colonna has a great quote, which says, this is an orthogonal, like, um, how am I that with, I am complicit in that I complain about? Why do I keep dating the same people? Why do I keep hiring the same people? Why do I keep whatever the same people? And his comment was early on in your life, early seven years, what, so why does the shadow exist? You didn't have emotional, social, or cognitive abilities, but you had a lot of stuff coming at you in the first seven, eight years of life. So you created algorithms to survive, pleasing technologies or whatever it happened to be, right? Yeah. Um, so number one is being self-aware. Um, what are the things that you continually do that just don't work out well? And that could be like entrepreneurs you back or people you hire. Here's an example. Uh, had a CEO who hired a C, had a hire, had hired a head of sales and had to fire him. So why do you fire him? Um, not organized, didn't like, did, uh, like with this whole array laundry of things. list of things. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Who hired him? I did, and not me, like him. Yeah. Great. The head of sales before him. What happened there? Oh, we had to fire him. Why? Not organized, very chaotic, the whole bit. Who hired him? What happened to the head of sales before him? Chaotic or whatever, right? So I just like stuck it out there. I said, so what was your childhood like? <laughs> Whoops. Um, Oh my God, my mom, my dad, which is utter chaos. Really, what was your superpower? I am so good at providing or order in chaotic environments. So Jerry Colonna's comment is, you seek, which is why, by the way, you talk to any of your boyfriends or girlfriends, like why do they do the people they do? It's because they develop superpowers that they get dopamine hits because their superpower comes out because guess what? They solved the problem treats. with their parent slash partner. Partner, whatever. And he's like, yeah. so what happens if you've developed a superpower and you can't use it? Mm. What do you seek? Now, this may sound really simplistic, but Jerry has this great quote. He says, when the shit hits a fan in a boardroom, it has nothing to do with a topic that literally just got dropped all the stuff that's been building up. You never got approval from your dad. You never got this. You never got that. You're in your brother. In, and everyone's going to be like, that's bullshit. Research says no. So, so at the end of the day, a couple things are critical. I mean, one is I'm a huge fan of coaches, therapists. Mm -hmm. The only way that you get through this is self-awareness. Yeah. Um, and, and, but it, one of the simplest ways is to say, okay, what I expected was a, what happened was B. Yeah. What it, uh, so I, like a journaling, like, so for example, when I'm like, so look back at the doggies and everything in the background, um, I literally laid out on the dating front, for example. So I'm very amicably divorced and the whole bit. And it, it, I literally had everyone I dated and my whole philosophy in life is around energy. And, and no, I'm not talking about crystals and hugging trees and stuff like that. What I'm talking about is Tim Ferriss does this, right? Like the annual review, what energizes you and what drains you. It's, it's a really simple test. So if you look over the past year, every person you've met, everything you did, every activity, did it energize you or did it drain you? Why is that important? Depression is literally lack of energy. Being in flow state 
being out of your head, lots of energy. Mm. And so I literally just laid out. So I did three things, by the way, you can do this with who you hire. So this is a very like Keith Ferrazzi, like share vulnerability moment here. Um, so I laid out everyone I'd ever dated. And I said, what is it that energized me about, energized about them and what drained me? Before I did that, I said, what do I think are the characteristics? Like, what, what do I think would bring me happiness? Did this exercise and I came and then did some walks with the dogs <laughs> for months. <laughs> and then I compared circling the 20% of the things, the 20% of the things that energized me the most, the things, the 20% that drained me the most. And then I used, and I did a death knell. I said, if I could only have this, so I did the top 10 and I said, if I could only have this or this, this or this. And I just watched literally like the, you know, the comp, like things move up and things move down. And I ended up with, oh shit. Like that, that is like almost like a disconnect between the two. The reason why I bring this up is the difference between these is your AI programming. I see. Hmm. You begin to realize that there are these if then statements that you've created. And by the way, this is the NLP training that Tony Robbins everyone does, right? That are programmed inside of you that, that Jung says, if you don't make conscious, we'll rule your life. And I will guarantee you that every entrepreneur, every board meeting, every hire, every person you date, every whatever, are driven by these if-then AI statements. And if you're not self-aware of them, you'll call them fate. I think there's a misconception about and from the founder and entrepreneurial community that somehow all VCs are cyborgs and all we think about is TAMs and traction and, and product market fit. And um, so I think one of the reasons why we have this podcast in the first place is to dispel of that notion. And mm -hmm, exactly. And uh, I, I don't know, Brie, I'm really curious because uh, you throughout the pandemic, throughout everything you have been, you still stay connected to everybody. Uh, it's, it's so impressive how connected you stay to everybody. Uh, I'm really curious from you and, and kind of tying it back into what Matt just said, you know, um, where I'm, and I'm going to struggle to articulate this exactly, but uh, that's what happens when you're a full bottle of sake down, I think, at this time. Good news. Good news is be vulnerable. Be uh, vul <laughs> we can be vulnerable here. Um, no, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think um, how many people, and this kind of harkens back to what we were talking about earlier, about ego. You know, Brie, how many times do you see a founder um, kind of embrace that concept of, waking up each day with less of an ego but then to to matt's last point kind of um and help me out matt if i'm if i'm butchering this but you know creating a dynamic in which you are kind of giving yourself up for something that's bigger than you. Victor Frankel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and 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 Bree, you might not have the answer, but I, well, I throw I it can, out to you. I mean, because, observationally, yeah, um, yeah. I don't think most entrepreneurs I've met have really like understood the concept of knowing thyself. And like, really, like if we go back to the hero's journey and the entrepreneur's journey, it's kind of understanding their skill sets. What are they good at? <clears throat> Kind of stock ranking it but not only just what am i good at with let's say coding or you know um sales or whatnot but what am i good at in terms of leadership hats so um am i a coach am i a leader am i a manager like there are all these different hats have all these different skill sets and i'd say the majority of of leaders 
um, CEOs don't really understand that about themselves. And then ego becomes their kind of default um, when they don't really understand how to situationally lead. <clears throat> and so um, the more out of control they get, the more they start to lead with ego. So I think you see more of their ego um, get bigger and they just lead with that kind of when they're starting to fail more. Sometimes it's on the rise. And I don't yeah. know, um, Matt and Vic, if you've ever studied um, like the, there's like the founder syndrome and it's a lot. They, they actually kind of studied it in the 90s with nonprofits, right? Because nonprofit founders, they start to get this huge ego because they feel like they're saving the world. Like they're taking on a cause and everyone's telling them they're a hero. Like you're, you're doing something great. You know, you're not doing this because of money. This is a nonprofit. And what they would find in these nonprofits is that their egos would get huge and they would lose the empathy centers of their brain in their leadership style because they would stop listening to people, stop using empathy. And the more you, the less you use your empathy, the more your brain cuts those empathy centers off and the more you become a tyrant. And I've seen that happen with CEOs. And I'd say it's a, I'd say that's only maybe 10 to 20% of entrepreneurs in the, in the startup space. But you do see this, like, I think class of entrepreneurs who, when they stop listening and they stop and, and they start having yes men around them. I mean, we've seen it in politics. We've seen it in nonprofits. We've seen it in every industry. Um, they become a tyrant. They don't listen. And, you know, they invade Ukraine. I mean, that's just what happens. So I would say, so it's so funny having this discussion real time with my kids because we're watching the Hulu Theranos. Mm. Mm -hmm. and we're watching the boiling of the frog and it's a slippery slope and it starts small but the beauty is at the end of the day darwin always steps in <laughs> yeah right bingo I'm like right and so if i was to say what is my so what is my mission in life I view my mission in life as being a Sherpa for these, for entrepreneurs trying to scale Everest, who have been given an oxygen tank and told just to climb and it's not a problem and don't worry about it. And then about half a mile in, they're like, wait, they're frozen dead bodies all over the place. And like, what the hell? Like, I didn't get an instruction manual, right? Yeah. And to be even more clear, um, and by the way, I think the world of, I mean, Travis has built Uber and Cloud Kitchen is amazing. So, but there was part of me that said, and this was the quote I tell people when they're like, well, what happened? And I was like, dear God, please tell me that the only success formula is not that if I lose my fear, I lose my drive. That the only mm. formula for success is the Travis model. Please tell me that the model is the John Mackey model from Whole Foods. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would argue that that is, especially with disease and the millennials, the future. And the reason why I've been thinking about this whole concept around forged capital of the tactical, traditional venture stuff with the coaching, which I now needed intervention. Um, <laughs> no, no, you don't. Is those two coming together like Reese's peanut butter cups? Is because I think that's the future, which is too many entrepreneurs survive entrepreneurship. They don't thrive. And right. The tragedy yeah. is that when you do entrepreneurship, it is brutal. There is scarcity. There's stuff. And guess what? Amor fati. It is an amazing opportunity to actually be self-aware and to dig deep and become a better, higher version of yourself. Or literally to grind it out from a yeah. place of fear and anxiety. Yeah. Um, and it is absolutely tragic. I haven't done this for 27 years to see the number of entrepreneurs who literally crawl across the finish line. Yeah, Matt, I think one of the things that I've seen over the pandemic, certainly exacerbated by the pandemic, was the fact that founders needed uh, therapists needed friends, needed people to confide in. And I love the fact that 
that Brie is just taking the largest swig of sake. I love the ever. timing of when she drinks, by the way. That was, like, was always like, 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 talking. I'm like, Nick's talking. Time to drink. That's like oh, COVID. Man. Distract him. COVID. <laughs> drink. Every time he says COVID, I drink. Yeah, COVID, we drink. Uh, no, I mean, look, the pandemic exacerbated some of these things. And I think what we what we saw is as me as a venture investor, as, as a VC and advisor to other founders was that they needed, they didn't need the VCs helping them with go-to-market or, uh, you know, product market fit in the earliest of situations or, introductions to customers or other investors. It was really about just needing a, a, a um, an ear to what they were ruminating over their problems as, you know, their personal problems. It was someone that had empathy and someone that was non-threatening, someone that they confide in. Um, and I think, I think that's what you're alluding to it's the it's the personal empathetic uh, qualities um, that founders shouldn't forget and can't forget while they're building things that I think you're alluding to with forge and um, with with the principles that you're trying to bring into uh, into play at Pritzker venture capital so, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that's that's the crux of it, right? There's this 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 yeah. whole empathy side of the of of it. So um, there are a whole, whole bunch of thoughts here. So I think if I merge my what's great about teaching, so I, I teach multiple classes now. And so it forces you to like really get it down to like the basics of like how do you think about entrepreneurship and all this kind of stuff. But then I also think about the real world stuff and the coach, like all of it is kind of fusing in this like huge mess. Yeah. But if I was think so if I think about it, my main takeaways here are the following. Number one, Steve Jurvin said it right. Steve Jurvinson said it right. He said, if you can see it, it's not the revolution. So therefore we are literally have selected a world in which um, it is about Nonlinearity. I can't see the future. So, how do you perform in that world when every every tool we're given is about if then state like you know how do I think about a linear world? Sure. Jobs to be done. Literally define the persona. It's as if you were a movie producer. You had a camera. You were in Florence at the courtyard. There is a woman or a man walking down, and you're following behind them. And there's an origin story and a moment of truth and emotion what the hell just happened versus intellectual. So, and I give this example all the time in my business classes. A bunch of business school guys said, here's how I want to enter uh, the baby space and the CAC and I'll be all this shit. Jessica Alba comes in to pitch to us about Honest Company. And she says, I'm in the delivery room. I draw the blood cord, 66 toxins. I poisoned my child, had this happen. It came through my skin. She's literally telling a story. How did this evil happen? I vowed that day, right? Call to action, mm -hmm. right? And every single person she talked to from that moment forward was like, join the cause. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, so number one, what is the origin story? Who is that crystal clear persona? What's the job to be done? What is the evil in the world? And then... What is your value proposition? What's your brand promise? Three words. And as a result, how do I know that I've delivered this and focus maniacally on those three words? And all the great entrepreneurs will say to their entire team, this is our values. This is who we are. These are the things that we will deliver. And by the way, if you ever forget like why you're doing what you want to do and you want to know if you go left or right, remember Susie or remember me in the delivery room or whatever, right? And by the way, as soon as you do that meme, that story, that whatever, everyone in the entire fucking firm knows exactly what they're supposed to do. Number two, if you're a venture capitalist, realize um, memento mori. When Marcus Reyes or the generals would come back from victory, there was a person in their back who would say, you two shall die. You two shall die like, 
literally don't let this get to your head. Venture capital, every eight years, well, 16 years in this case, every firm gets wiped off the face of the earth, or a lot of them, and they reconstitute. So first of all, realize how do you want to show up the St. Peter's test? Your job as a VC is really simple. Number one, start with the heart, move to the mind, which is, okay, yes, we have a database, 400 companies, every metric in e-commerce, we know CAC, LTV, repay rate, whatever, right? So yeah, don't violate like the laws of physics, but your job is very simple. If you want to be in the venture business in the long run, karmical synchronicity, every single, an entrepreneur said to me this, you have met a thousand entrepreneurs and you won't even remember this meeting. I've met 10 VCs. I know what you ate for lunch. <laughs> oh, I like that. Single meeting is a marketing encounter. Yeah. Did you leave the campground cleaner? Are you a Sherpa? Do you legitimately want them a la the Pete Fenton test? Do you literally want them to become a better version of themselves to be successful, even if you're not invested? If you do, synchronicity kicks in and you like a la Brad Feld. Fred Wilson, anyone else who's been in the venture business more than 20 years, they all have the same element. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, look, we are running out of time. Uh, so it is time for our final segment, which we are gonna have to do in rapid fire rapid. form. Mm -hmm. uh, but as Give we've done, drink. yes, as we've done in each of our previous seasons, we end each of our episodes with five questions adapted oh, from Chuck Klosserman's Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs. Tonight, in episode one of season three, we are debuting our own questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm going to have Bree kick us off. Matt, we're going to need quick fire, bop, 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 and we'll get through all five of them. Just FYI. We have not changed up our format. Uh, unfortunately, Matt has been traveling. We have been sending gifts to the wrong <laughs> residents. Uh, and so he will receive a vest uh, when he gets back to Chicago um, to signify that he, he, he did receive and he did answer these questions. Um, but beyond that, let it be known that uh, we have we have in, in, endowed him with wonderful gifts um, beyond, <laughs> beyond his beyond yeah, the Steve his Jobs outfit. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's exactly. the Elizabeth Holmes, the Steve Jobs. That's exactly. why we had to get you a vest. I, I, you're, you're wearing the entrepreneur uniform. You need the VC uniform. Definitely need there the VC go. uniform. So, without ado, our five questions in rapid fire format. Bree, why don't you start us off? Okay, Matt, it's the year 2050. Are you living in a colony on Mars or the metaverse? Man, that's a brutal, like, <laughs> maybe. Uh, uh, There's no wrong or wrong. Computing, answer. computing, <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if or like if. Your or. AI is trying to figure out where to go. Seven year old that. self, what does he say? The yeah. Seven year old self says if those are the only two options, uh, Mars, because yeah. I am able to be a human being and be me. Fair. Okay. Excellent. Number two, would you prefer to see a documentary made about you? or a Hollywood action flick a la Point Break? Oh, wait, wait do you literally just With say you I, as the main character. With or as Yeah, Keanu there's Reeves. a story. Uh, <laughs> you would be <laughs> Matt McCall. Is that who you would and cast I, as yourself? Keanu Reeves would, would be you, Matt McCall. Oh, I mean, un, like if there was a human being in the world of Hollywood that I would be like so ecstatic to be would be Keanu Reeves. Okay. If you want to see like, by the way, everyone, and this is like, yes, I'm sorry. I'm like diatribing here, but do the YouTube video of Keanu Reeves in the subway station, New York city video. 
oh my God, this guy literally like takes a subway. He's hanging out with, he is just an everyday. He's, so Matt wants a Hollywood film with Keanu playing Matt. I see it already. I can see yes. it. Yes. I can <laughs> absolutely see it. And calling out to me as like, by the way, Matt did this. Oh I no, I can see it. I can see it. I love it. it. First of all, in, in a, uh, we you don't know, have a lot of time, but I would just say in a different world, I think Matt and Keanu, and maybe in this world, Matt and Keanu would be fantastic drinking buddies, like together. Oh, Do you know 100%. Nanea with Trip? I was about to, again, another reason we need to be married, because <laughs> I have a proposal. <laughs> I love so it. <laughs> and so she is, by the way, an incredibly human being and an entrepreneur. I love her product. I use it. And, and if you get to every, anyone who gets to know her and, and her cousin is Keanu Reeves. But anyways. Uh, For the first five listeners who, who hit me up on LinkedIn that are listening to this, I will give you a free lifetime membership to Trip. They are oh, a wow. whole VR um, experience. It's psychedelic. It's for your mental health. And I love it. I use it on Oculus. Um, I have some lifetime passes because Trip is a client. They use one yes. of our CFOs. We love Trip. Um, I wasn't planning on doing that, but here we are. Okay, third question. I love you. this. Okay, <laughs> and, and by the way, it's calm and VR. That literally is scientifically based. Yes. calm and VR. Back it's by Tim amazing. Shane, oh my God. One of my. By the way, shout out to one of my other VC buddies. So why I don't know why I'm doing this because I'm not supposed to ever shout out to another VC, right? Because I'm a VC. Oh, but you should you always. Tim Chang, Tim Chang, awesome human being, and many uh, great trip. Anyway, sorry. They will, uh, they will love this. Okay, third question. I, by the way, I'm personally, before I, I was in love with Matt, mm-hmm. I was in love with Tim. Like, Tim made me oh. want to be a better venture capitalist. So, anyway, we'll get into okay, that Okay, third later question. Someday. You've and got- I'll tell you how he helped me on my shroom trip. Anyways, anyways. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> my what? <laughs> this is just coming out at the last five minutes of this conversation. It's the hand. It's the, like oh. when you leave the room and the hand goes in the doorknob. That's when all the good stuff comes out. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly. We, we've it. learned that in this podcast because there's alcohol involved. Um, yes. It is. Got... Everyone go to Rhythmia. Everyone go to Rhythmia, by the way. Rhythmia, five, Costa Rica, correct? 5,000 five star reviews. Wow. Okay. 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 We'll, put it, we'll put it in one of the 10 links in our YouTube. One last meal, tacos or sushi. <laughs> oh, you you did not pick those two. Yeah, the best tacos <laughs> are the best sushi. What are you gonna go with, Matt? Those What's are last literally meal? my top two. Those yeah. are my top two. Um, uh, it doesn't matter. You have to pick one. Okay, sushi. Brutal. But sushi. Uh, I think you're a better man for it. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> you can differentiate, or can you differentiate between the artist? And the artwork. No, they're one literally one and the same. One is a manifestation of the other. I feel the same way. Thank you, Matt. We should be married. Damn it. Oh my God. So Vic, can we uh can (laughs) are we gonna live stream the marriage? Yes. We can. We can. Uh Dan might have something. Yeah, Daniel might have a problem with that, but you know, if he doesn't put a ring on it soon. Um okay. Three startups are in your sweet spot, okay? They're solving the same exact problem, same problem. They come to you looking for funding. Okay, here are the three different companies. The first has the characteristics of a successful team, okay? That the type of team you look for. Second has differentiated technology. And the third has fantastic early traction. They're the leader. Which do you invest in? Number one. Yeah, duh. And so number, so by the way, uh, Carter, I, the folks at Pritchko, we literally went back over 25 years, every entrepreneur we backed or didn't back and said, what were the characteristics from the venture and the operating side? Number one, uh, this goes back to any entrepreneur, like, you know, like it's, assuming there's any entrepreneur listening right now um, at this juncture, but Number one is have they lived the problem? Or is this like an intellectual challenge? 
Number two, team wise, is um, are they coachable? Do they know their blind spots? Number one cause of death is blind spot, right? Number three is like relentlessness. Um, like, and that ties in obviously to number one, and there are like a bunch of others after this at the end of the day we can kind of go through. So it's, it's team, 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 but within the construct of does it pass the IQ test, right? As Warren Buffett said, a good team in a fundamentally flawed business, the business will keep its reputation. However, between three teams, what do I look for? I always say, start with the heart, move to the mind. Is there a story? Is it an origin story? Are you doing this because you've lived this problem and you vow because of Aunt Julia, whatever, that this, this is an evil that will change? I, I, Matt, if I can, uh, I think you've more than earned the vest that is coming your way <laughs> when, you, when you get back to Chicago. Um, and we are so grateful for you to join us tonight and to give your time up uh, to talk to us um, while you're in transit back home. Uh, so we, we appreciate that. Um, as we do always with, with each of our episodes, we ask our guest to um, give us a toast. Uh, and this is your moment to shine light on a cause or a startup or, or an individual, um, anything really. Uh, you can wax poetic for the next minute, but this is your minute. Uh, and um, we'd love to, to, to get that last moment from you. Last moment for me. Um, if so, for every entrepreneur out there, for every VC out there, the question you have to ask is why are you doing what you're doing? And if you had the St. Peter, St. Peter's test, which is you got hit by a truck and had to explain the last 30 days of your life. Is this what you'd have to literally explain? Or would you literally rewrite it and say, this is what I wish I had done. And then on an ongoing basis, live that life. Within the construct of don't be homeless and penniless and like whatever. So there we go. Cheers. Cheers to that. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. And with Thanks. that, a Matt. reminder, if you like that episode, hit like and subscribe and check out our previous episodes. Matt, thank you so thank much you. for coming on. We have to have you on because there is a laundry list of questions that we have beyond this, but thank you so much.